Hello folks, I'm Jeffrey Fox. This is AI First Engineering class. We're looking at um, transitions in various industries, and now we're doing space and energy, actually starting with energy. And uh, let's get going with that. Energy, where the uh, we are of course looking at the impact of IT and deep learning. Uh, though at the level we're doing energy, the difference between deep learning and other forms of AI are not really apparent. But a lot of what we discuss for AI will actually be uh, um, deep learning. All right, <clears throat> now we have a first of six slides um, which describe two interrelated technologies, which aren't trivially interconnected, but are in practice. That's clean energy or use of renewables and <coughs> micro grids and the combination is producing instead of a um, a giant a network of giant power stations which is the current typical grid model is producing a more hierarchical structure where lots of small energy uh, sources are linked together as as microgrids and those microgrids are fed into uh, uh, a giant distribution system. Previously, the, the all the energy was at the upper level and it went down into distributed places. Now you still have going down to distributed places through these hubs, but um, you also go up from the hubs to other hubs. If one area, um, maybe it's very windy, so one area with a lot of wind farms has too much energy and so on. Whereas other energy, other other um, sites which uh, rely on so solar power and there's not much sun need some energy. So we we have we need a mix of sources to balance energy production and under all circumstances. All right, so this is described here: the rise of renewables, wind and solar, uh, both are variable for obvious reasons, um, and you can't just Turn and turn a knob and get more wind, or turn a knob and get more sun. You have what you have, and um, we will discuss a little later on the impact on batteries. And as we pointed out, these um, resources are typically distributed, DERs, and often relatively small scale uh, in any one unit. Um, and also some of them can store energy with the batteries or similar technologies. And some, some monitor energy, some manage energy. And they're all edge technologies in the, in the language we're familiar with from uh, the cloud and the, and the edge computing environment. And of course, all of this is actually both um, encouraged and enabled by software. And that software is driving lots and lots of AI and machine learning. That, uh, and we'll see examples of how that machine learning slash AI slash deep learning is used to make decisions, to do monitoring, to do optimizations, and so on. All right, so this was the old model. And we have to have local distribution areas, substations, but uh, the distributed energy is different in that the origin lies inside these LDAs, not outside and coming into LDAs. And then we have this interface between the transmission and distribution system, which is here, where they meet. And there is an article here describing that, and I've already noted the analogy between cloud and edge computing, where some people believe the, well, actually, I wrote a paper once um, a long time ago pointing out that uh, when we were talking about exascale computing, we had got way past exascale on the edge already. Um, so here is a comment on the, some of the futures of energy. We have here a community solar, a solar environment with the solar panels on our on our pic over our picnic tables, and it points out that even your favorite electric cars can be useful because they can store energy because they have giant batteries in them. And so, in this distributed world you live in, <coughs> you could um, 
store energy. And when you plug in your electric car at night, it may not actually charge up. Maybe you'd uh, pay, you gain some money by storing energy overnight or something like that. So that's sort of a, a pretty interesting. And of course, although each car can't do very much, if you had 10 million electric cars in your state, you could do quite a lot probably. And we all know that the recent wildfires in California, they were sometimes somewhat um, caused by difficulties with power and electrical distribution. Here's the concept of a microgrid, which is a very small unit of power. And here's a lady in a nice place in California, Oceanside. And she has a microgrid which powers her wheelchair and her, uh, and her car. And it will also run the house in the case of a blackout. And given she's in California, she can probably use solar power to get to build her microgrid. And of course, she can sell her power back to the global grid when she's not using it. Here is some statement about the difference between moving totally off the standard grid or partially off. And the break even point for partially off is much lower, um, much nearer in time than uh, for the uh, full grid perfection. Full grid defection. 2030 is the earliest, it looks as though it's possible. If you just say we're going to um, generate 80% of our own energy, which is actually a huge amount and not really possible today anyway, then the break even point in terms of cost is uh, more like um, 2022. These, this plot here is the cost of the avoided electricity. And this, which is the same in, essentially the same in both plots, is a bit more expensive here, but not much. And I also don't why that is. And the the cost of the generated distributed energy is much lower here because it's just doing, it's not making the optimization to deliver everything in a reliable fashion. It's delivering what it can and assuming it can buy power from the grid when necessary. Uh, probably the cost here is lower because you're running your power plants at a, in a less expensive fashion to produce less energy. All right, here we have um, some comment on the amount of money going into this field. And so you can see that um, clean energy is not is reasonably popular. I don't know about the average here. Six billion dollar a year average over the last uh, 15 years. You see it ramped up here. It's peaked in like actually a lot of things peaked. That was a time that uh, financial banking peaked a little. Well, peaked more like here, but uh, actually it was a pretty enlightened time in 2010 to 2014, and now it's starting to go up again. And um, so that that's sort of quite interesting. And here's a little discussion of batteries. Um, and the point is that as you have these very variable uh, variable production units, uh, wind and solar, uh, you're going to have to store the power you make when the wind is blowing hard or the sun is sh shining down hard. You have to store it and use it at a, at a later time. And um, you need a good battery for that. And the battery, a lithium iron battery, which is the usual one, is um, not, is pretty expensive. And uh, there are other forms of battery which are not practical to put on your Tesla or on your smartphone, but quite practical for this rather static type of storage, which is not. Uh, which, which has different trade-offs from the lithium-ion applications. And here is a cost of lithium-ion batteries, to the four-hour battery. And um, we have here its um, cost per kilowatt hour, in, uh, and it's around uh, 200. Um, and with various assumptions about um, different uh, models. And bad down here are more like, well, probably less than 10 
you have the uh, battery from Form Energy, which is a small company with $50 million money raised, uh, built out of water and sulfur. So this is not something you can put on your Tesla. Uh, we don't want water slushing around at the bottom of our Tesla. And, um, and so, the, once, the, once the amount of power generated by renewables, and therefore renewables are the same as variables, uh, with the variable production units, then you need more and more desperately need batteries to tide you over the uncertainties. Here is a, actually a, a, a battery built out of bricks, and um, it's presumably servicing this wind farm here. Uh, well, here's a, a few slides about uh, fusion. And fusion's an interesting area because it's been studied for an awful long time, more or less since the end of the Second World War. It's a large activity, especially in the Department of Energy. And people have almost grown to expect fusion to fail. And there's some sort of comment, and maybe, well, we know the government didn't do such so brilliantly in space. And once it's actually commercialized space, an enormous the progress seems to have really accelerated. So you might imagine that um, commercializing fusion could produce some significant improvements. So here's a company, Tokamak Energy, just raised 87 million, and. Um, they claim to be able to get clean fusion by 2030. And um, here's their uh, particular uh, novel uh, device. This is the so-called Tokamak, which is um, has which is the plasma. The plasma is where the uh, atoms which are going to fuse run around. And they have to have huge pressure and temperature and things to actually fuse, and the claim is that um, this company can do it where other co where the government has so far just hasn't really succeeded. All right, so here you have um, discussion of fusion as a piece of physics. Normal fusion is hydrogen plus hydrogen to become helium, and uh, that releases a lot of energy. And um, you can uh, do this with uh, deuterium and tritium. And uh, it only needs 150 million degrees Celsius. And this thing, which is normally sh shaped in a toroidal fashion, like a bagel, it's called a tokamak. And there are several tokamaks. They're building a giant new tokamak called Itter in, uh, in Europe. And uh, it, it has this superheated gas containing the deuterium and tritium. That's called plasma. The science studying tokamaks is called plasma physics. And it's all um, contained and things by superconducting magnets, which make the uh, electrons run around in the right fashion. And um, they also heat and heat the gas and things like that. So the tokamak energy you saw had a spherical um, tokamak. And that's a uh, difference from the standard ones, which are toroidal. And um, it's so far got to 15 million. Well, that's not quite 150, but it's somewhere. And we'll have to see how they succeed. Uh, and coming back to actually deep learning, there's a reasonably well-known piece of deep learning connected to this field, which was done by people at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. And they built the Princeton Fusion Recurrent Neural Network Code, which is uh, published in Nature here, his Nature, and called Predicting Disruptors Instabilities in Control Fusion Plasmas. And so one of the difficulties with um, uh, fusion is that the plasma can become unstable. And if the plasma becomes unstable in a bad fashion, it will actually uh, damage the the um, tokamak and may take many months to recover. So you must try to predict the instability ahead of time and do something, effectively switch off the machine or 
change the operation of the machine so that the uh, um, instability does not lead to a disaster, but just to uh, um, a restart, which is not many months, just I don't know, minutes or seconds or something. So, all right, so that's uh, they designed this nifty uh, neural net shown here. You can see here we have a convolutional neural net. Uh, that is combined with general information here to form a, a vector, which is um, uh, the 1D features which come from the convolution, 100, length 128. Um, that's combined with various static variables, is fed through a LSTM, and then it's outputted. And you train it as to whether or not it's going to produce the instability. And, uh, here is the tokamak, and here is the insta here is sort of a picture of the data. So this is done entirely with data at this uh, jet tokamak. This is not nothing to do with that startup. This is a, a particular tokamak run by um, somewhere in Europe, I believe. Oh uh, yes, yeah, the European Fusion Media Library, and. Um, it, it basically you feed in, you measure uh, the radial the distribution of your um, of your plasma, uh, the various things, the velocities, pressures, and so on. You feed that in, and then you get a, a one this 1D profile, which is here, and then you look at the time dependence of that profile and try to predict the catastrophe. And um, <clears throat> It has all the usual features. So this is a quite interesting because it combines an image. This is actually a 1D image, not a 2D image. Uh, these filters here are just uh, one dimensional in, in space, uh, multiple filters. And um, they are used to identify, to, to capture the structure of this in, in space. And then the LSTM captures the structure in time, because LSTM is the standard sophisticated recurrent neural net used for studying time dependence. The last few slides on this uh, energy uh, discussion come from a, a um, German energy company called Next Kraftwerk. And uh, they basically survey, it's their survey of artificial intelligence in the energy industry. And it has uh, four segments. Uh, basically, the power grid itself, um, power consumption, uh, what we call virtual power plant, that's what we already discussed about microgrids. And finally, in the sort of um, trading hall, wherever you, this is not trading energy, energy company stocks, it's trading energy. So the, the different people who want to use energy, they actually bid for energy, and that's a well established. Um, market-driven way of uh, sharing power among different people. All right, so here we have the power grid, and there are a couple of slides on that. And um, it's, all, it's somewhat to do with coupling sectors together, because um, we need to network uh, power across the boundaries of these different sectors, across different uh, production mechanisms. And we need AI because this is getting more and more complicated. So we pointed out there's more and more renewables, more and more microgrids, and so it's getting a very sophisticated uh, distributed network. Um, now we have, of course, the concept of a smart power grid or a smart electrical grid. And um, we need to react to the consumption. So we have to measure how much energy is being used and adapt the system about how the energy is routed around and where it's stored and things like that according to consumption. Maybe, maybe it's very hot in some area and the air conditioning is being switched up and so it needs more power and so on. And obviously this is a perfect thing. You could train a deep learning network to actually understand all of this and control where, where, the, where the power is actually routed. Um, here we have another set of um, grid things about um, the fact that we have cars running around carrying energy with them in their batteries. 
Um, and they say we can consider storing electricity in the cars, and that will help to stabilize the grid. Uh, we, you know, here we have a poor old, poor old uh, town in California running out of energy. So you just pour in the Teslas and pump up the electrical power. Uh, now, just as I pointed out that the plasmas become unstable, is well known the grids can come unstable. There's been some dramatic blackouts coming from instabilities um, when thing when you get resonances and so on. One failure produces multiple failures, and again, AI in this area is obviously uh, important. Fraunhofer Institute must be somewhere in Germany, and um, the whole monitoring and maintenance of the electrical power grid is just sitting there studying signals for anomalies, perfect for AI. So AI is needed there as well. Here we have uh, this trading. Well, we know that actually AI is pretty useful for stock market trading. Well, if we're trading in electricity rather than stocks, we can also use AI, uh, and because we have the past data, we can decide how to bid and actually do a, do something which makes a win-win for everybody, because uh, people make better use of electricity, and it will also help. You know the. Our goal of increasing more and more the amount of renewables in the energy source, because those renewables produce more uncertainties, which a clever AI program can help by improving the way we predict the impact of these these rather variable renewable energy sources. And of course. Already, I gather AI has, show, has been got better and better in this area, and so we need to actually have less reserve of energy stored. And even as the, in some sense, the need for it increases, because as we know, the more and more these volatile um, renewables, which just vary in in the amount of energy produced and uh, with time and the and space. Uh, as we increase the number of renewables, we'd expect to have to increase the control reserve. But actually, we've got our AI management of the system has got so much better, that is not true. All right, the next, uh, this company I told you was in virtual power plants. And um, this is some sort of a collection of renewables, which together performs an effective power plant. And again, the AI can actually manage and produce your, I mean, your virtual power plant is basically AI plus a collection of generators. And um, we can um, obviously decide how to, we can use the expected um, need for electricity, which certainly varies with time, but can be learned from previous day's measurements. And um, we can even have a little, AI robot trading on our behalf in the energy market. And um, we can also detect evil people who are doing things they ought not to do. And here we now, the last uh, comment here is on uh, power consumption. And um, we, we can. Um, Monitor that and optimize the use of, of the actual, make certain the power is not wasted. There's lots of nifty smart home uh, devices. We all, we've actually mentioned that already. This is something which has been ready to take off um, probably for 30 years, but hasn't actually taken off. And we have smart meters and smart, smart light bulbs and smart everything, so refrigerators. Uh, but eventually these will take off. Uh, here we have smart network air conditioning systems. Remember, this is the industrial Internet of Things. Every device made by GE and other such companies is meant to have AI in it and sensors and monitors, where the AI is either on the machine or <coughs> back at the at the home base, namely the cloud, which controls everything. So. We can also fold in with nice AI user preferences, just as Facebook folds in user preferences when it does its AI analysis of users when they log on 
and they optimize the experience of the user and maybe even optimize the power consumption of the user's laptop based on what they know about the user's needs. So that's that's so that's sort of a, the finish of the discussion of the different uses of AI from this company, which uh, seems to be a reasonably comprehensive discussion. Thank you.